Now I'm pleased to introduce our first speaker. Dr. Ed Shao, professor at the University of California, San Francisco, is a member of the International Clinical Council on FOP. He is currently a professor in endocrinology at UCSF and manages their metabolic bone clinic. Dr. Shao will be speaking to us today about COVID and FOP. Over to you, Dr. Shao. Great. Good morning. Thank you very much, Hope, and thank you everybody for this chance to talk a little bit about our work and also to update people about COVID-19 vaccines and FOP. I'm going to start very first by thanking the very important people who have helped contribute to all of our projects here at UCSF, as well as uh, the clinical research coordinators that have really made some of this work possible. So for today, I'm going to spend a little bit of time just going over um, coronavirus. I think after the past two and a half years, most people are uh, pretty uh, aware about what uh, coronavirus is doing. Um, but I'm also just going to re briefly review a couple of the key strategies that are important for preventing spread. And I'm going to do a brief introduction about the vaccines, as well as some of the new vaccines that are being considered. Uh, tell you a little bit about the UCSF COVID study results. This is a study that was done uh, with uh, many of the patients here at, at UCSF, as well as other people who had contributed data um, from around the world. Um, and then also just review the current uh, International Clinical Council on FOP recommendations. I'm just gonna start with some of the key take home points. Coronavirus can be spread and can lead to significant illness, especially even with some of the new variants, which may be a little bit milder, um, but they still are significant for patients with FOP. Patients with FOP are at high risk of complications from severe COVID, especially because of the lung uh, problems that can be seen in FOP. Prevention with hand washing, masking, and physical distancing, those still remain the critical aspects uh, for control. And family members and close contacts should be vaccinated for FOP. Patients with FOP should discuss vaccination with their doctor. And there are many local regulations. So we'll talk about some of the recommendations today, but just keep in mind that you need to check with your local health authorities for advice um, because the medications and the strategies for management can be different between different locations. So there are a couple of general recommendations that we like to make for all of our patients with FOP. Respiratory exercise to maintain lung capacity is really important. This is important where it prevents what we call atelectasis, or basically where parts of the lung don't fully inflate. It's important to maintain diaphragm and respiratory muscle strength, and we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and, but there is con definitely controversy about what the specific exercises are that you should do. However, just doing exercises overall is really important. And so these include things like deep breathing exercises to really encourage movement, um, and uh, groups of 10 exercises can sometimes be really helpful. And these just include taking a really deep breath and then letting it slowly out. You can also use an incentive spirometer or peak flow whistle. whistle. We've talked about this in the past, and I'll just go through very briefly uh, what a peak spirometer, uh, incentive spirometer is. Um, other patients may like singing or uh, playing certain games, like for the kids, if you have um, a cup of water that has a little bit of soap in it, and then just having them blow bubbles, that can be really important. So for some patients, having medications to thin the mucus uh, or saline nebulizers to sort of help clear things out, that can be really helpful. But what you really do need to do is make sure to talk with your primary care physician to find the right set of exercises and the find, the find the right set of common uh, right combination of medications to really take care of things uh, uh, to the best that you can. And there is an uh, IFOPA website for improving lung health that you should take a look at because this is really important. When you're looking for an incentive spirometer, there are many that are available on all sorts of different websites. Uh, the type of incentive spirometer that you're looking for looks something like this. It's basically, it works by in, uh, encouraging deep breaths and you inhale. And there are no sort of, there's this little piston that goes up and down to tell you how fast you're inhaling, um, but there's no balls like this one. This one, you have to hold it straight up. And so this is actually a very difficult one to do um, because if you sort of tilt and things like that, the balls don't actually um, run correctly. And so that makes it much harder. So what you're looking for is something like this. Um, it doesn't have to be this brand, but it can be 
um, a number of different ones, but it's basically encouraging deep breaths. What I want to do is just talk a little bit about the two main infections that um, we are likely going to be seeing coming up uh, this fall and winter. So the first one is influenza. Um, this is caused by a virus called influenza A or influenza B. Its transmission is primary respiratory. And it's, uh, the key symptoms that you'll see are going to be things like fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, and achiness. You can prevent transmission by wearing masks. Um, and also doing hand washing and avoiding sick contacts as much as possible. There is a vaccine that is available. This is the flu vaccine, and it targets the most likely strains for this coming year. It's not perfect, but it is really important for reducing symptoms and for decreasing the severity of an infection if you were to get influenza. Our recommendation has not changed over the past uh, many years uh, for patients with FOP the flu vaccine can be given subcutaneously. There should be no flare within the past two weeks. And we do recommend that you pre-dose with acetaminophen um, or ibuprofen to try to decrease the risks of inflammation in the flare. We do recommend that all family members and close contacts be vaccinated for flu. And if it's suspected that you might have flu, you should see your doctor. Um, you should definitely wear a mask to prevent spread. You can get influenza testing usually by a nasal swab. It's not as easily um, available as um, the, the coronavirus um, testing right now, um, but the clinics can actually do this. And in the event that you are diagnosed with flu, you should consider oseltamivir, which is Tamiflu, to try to mitigate severity. Um, so the main reason for the testing is so that you could um, do the Tamiflu. The challenge comes for the SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus vaccine uh, 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 virus, because the coronavirus symptoms are very similar to flu. You have fever, cough, sore throat, runny nose, achiness, and for about half of the patients, a sense of loss, uh, a loss of the taste or smell. Prevention is again, things like masks to avoid transmission, hand washing, and avoiding sick contacts. There are vaccines that are available. The approved vaccines are currently intramuscular. And uh, this is, uh, it's been completely uh, unclear still in terms of how this should be used in vulnerable populations. But I will tell you, I will show you a little bit of data that we have about the use of intramuscular vaccinations in patients with FOP. There are newer formats that are being tested. These include intranasal and subcutaneous. Um, the challenge with this is that the safety of these um, new vaccines are unknown. These are still in the testing phase. Uh, and so we do not recommend those at the moment. And this includes some of the intranasal vaccines that are being developed in India and China, as well as other places. If you suspect that you may have COVID-19, you should see your doctor as soon as possible. Again, wear a mask. You should get influenza testing to just make sure that you don't have influenza instead of the COVID-19 and get the SARS-CoV-2 testing. You can get the, the over-the-counter SARS-CoV-2 uh, viral testing at pretty much any pharmacy right now. Uh, and so that uh, antigen test uh, can be very helpful. Just keep in mind is that the antigen test may not turn positive for a couple of days. So you do need to test two days apart. And if you are positive, you can work with your physician to consider whether antiviral medications or monoclonal antibodies may be appropriate for you. This is important because you need to do these early on uh, in the infection to try to decrease the severity of the infection. And depending on the strains and depending on what's available at your particular location, uh, the treatment uh, options will be different. So again, your primary care physician is critical in this process. So the key things just to, to emphasize are that um, prevention is critical, avoiding sick contacts, especially asymptomatic patients who might be starting uh, or have had exposure. Um, those are tricky situations because coronavirus can be transmitted by asymptomatic um, uh, contacts. Uh, just keep in mind that the longer that the exposure that you have, the higher the risk. <clears throat> Try to do physical distancing by at least three to six feet. Wear a mask when you're around others. Thankfully, we are now able to get N95 
KN95, KF94, all of these higher quality masks. So you should try to get those uh, and wear those if possible. Avoid situations where others are not wearing masks, things like indoor restaurants. And just remember, we don't provide masks for kids under age two because there is um, a risk of suffocation. So um, young kids do not wear masks. You should try to increase room ventilation as much as possible. And wash your hands often. Use hand sanitizer, especially in public places after blowing your nose, coughing, sneezing, things like that. Make sure you consider vaccination, certainly at least for the subcutaneous uh, route for the flu vaccine, but consider vaccination also for COVID-19. And make sure you clean and disinfect your high touch surfaces on a daily basis. Continue to watch for symptoms and as always contact your medical team for any kind of advice. So just to go through this a little bit, <clears throat> um, the different types of uh, vaccines that are available, um, there are multiple different ways for um, vaccinating against coronavirus. The two big ones that you've heard around are the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines, which uses an mRNA vaccine. These have proven to be very efficacious and very safe. The more traditional ones are like the AstraZeneca, the Sputnik, and um, the J&J. &J. These use a viral vector, um, basically to carry in the DNA into human cells. And then also there's like the Novavax vaccine, which uses a protein subunit, which is just a portion of the coronavirus uh, virus itself uh, to, to induce the vaccine. And then there are also some that uh, like the Sinopharm and Sinovac that use an activated virus. The coronavirus does cause the COVID-19 disease. And so just remember that when somebody talks about coronavirus, they're talking about the virus itself. And COVID-19 is the symptoms and the manifestation of the viral infection. So all of these vaccines, um, there are multiple. These are the most common ones um, that are currently available. What you can see is that many of them require multiple shots, like two shots um, apart. Um, they have proven to be relatively safe. And um, certainly the Pfizer and Moderna ones have been very well tolerated. They do get localized inflammation and flu-like symptoms. And so we'll talk a little bit about how to mitigate those. The Johnson & Johnson um, is a little bit less common at the moment just because there is um, a potential risk for blood clots. Uh, and so people have been watching that as well as the AstraZeneca. And then um, the other ones, again, depending on your specific location, include the Sputnik, the Sinopharm, and then the Novavax. So the International Clinical Council on FOP has developed guidelines for taking the COVID vaccine for patients with FOP. Um, a critical part is that the family members should be vaccinated um, with whatever vaccine is available. All of them are equally efficacious. And really, those vaccines are meant to try to decrease the severity. Keep in mind that vaccines are not designed to prevent infection. It's to decrease the severity if the infection occurs. Maintain physical distancing, wear masks, and maintain hand hygiene even if you're vaccinated. Um, again, transmission is really sort of the important part of the prevention steps. And the risk of COVID complications is high in our FOP community. So doing as much prevention um, is really important. The ICC recommends that each patient consider the pros and cons of vaccination for their particular situation. And you should consult with your local doctor uh, and your FOP doctor before taking the vaccine. And this also allows the physicians to help go through all of the different steps that are important for safely taking the vaccine. You should check the ICC FOP org website for recommendations if you decide to take the vaccine. And we'll briefly talk about those recommendations at the end. So I wanted to tell you a little bit about the UCSF FOP um, and COVID study. Um, this was done by uh, Samuel Cow and also by Haley Wallace and Rhonda Lee here in our team. Um, we had initially reported, and many of you had contributed data, um, basically looking at 32 patients with FOP. Um, we had a number of people who had tested positive for COVID-19 um, and developed the symptoms, as well as uh, seven patients who had contact with a COVID-19 person um, or high-risk contact, and then 15 patients who received the vaccine. I'm actually going to add in some additional data because we had 15 additional subjects that we were able to contribute to this study. Uh, and this is uh, currently in review right now. 
but we now have a combined cohort with 19 events of um, positive COVID-19 tests and 23 events um, of patients who have received COVID-19 vaccination. So we're starting to grow our numbers. A couple of interesting things sort of came out. First of all, the patients um, uh, with, with COVID-19, they reported the symptoms um, and, and you can see that the symptoms are very much similar to what we have been hearing about the general population. Things like uh, weakness and fatigue, loss of sense of smell, cough, fever, sore throat. These are by far the most common ones um, that are occurring. And so basically patients with FOP who get COVID-19 get very much the same types of symptoms as um, the general population. One critical thing is this, is hospitalization. We did have a number of patients who were hospitalized. So COVID-19 remains a very severe disease and it's something that you do need to be very aware of. So for the patients who have received vaccine, again, we have 23 of these patients now, um, they get the same types of symptoms as the general population too. Pain and soreness at the injection site, tiredness and fatigue, um, some swelling and headaches. Again, these are sort of the main types of side effects that we expect in the general population. For patients with FOP, the key things that we were interested in were flare, um, and um, the uh, hospitalization and heterotopic ossification. And we didn't see that in our, in our patient population. So I think that was very reassuring. So the key things to do, um, and, and for all of the patients in our study, they followed this uh, set of recommendations. So we recommend that you follow these if you decide to take the COVID vaccine. You need to discuss with your medical team and you know, plan ahead. Make sure that there's no flare that has occurred for at least the two weeks prior to vaccination. Um, many of the sites are relaxing this, but not all sites, is that they are recommending no ibuprofen, acetamin, or NSAIDs or steroids before the vaccine. If the site allows you to do these medications before the vaccine, that's fine. Um, but just be aware that for some of the sites, um, they may say that uh, you need to not be on these medications. We recommend taking the vaccine using the route it was designed for. We know that it is intramuscular. So it seems that patients with FOP can tolerate the intramuscular vaccination. It still does have a risk of heterotopic ossification and a flare, but at least in the 23 patients we have so far, that seems to be pretty uh, low risk. Um, inject at a site that would be less impacted by heterotopic ossification than it forms. So we do not recommend doing things like in the buttocks because that if there is a heterotopic ossification or flare, it makes it very difficult to sit. But if someone has already fused, uh, let's say their shoulder, then that becomes a good site um, for uh, any sort of types of vaccinations. We do recommend taking acetaminophen and ibuprofen for the 48 hours after the vaccination, even if you're feeling totally fine. This is to try to minimize the amount of inflammation and making sure that you have steroids on hand in case a major flare does occur. We don't know if this process will prevent all complications, but it's our best recommendation at the time. And at least for the 23 patients that we've been following, it seems to work pretty well. And again, the full recommendations are on the iccfop.org website. You can print them out and also give them to your physician. So for masking, just a reminder, um, High quality masks, so basically a really good cotton mask um, or a surgical mask, especially for patients with FOP, even though these are not like the best types of um, masks for preventing transmission, they are still very valuable and they may be more comfortable, especially for patients with FOP um, because of the, the, the restriction um, in uh, breathing that occurs with N95 and KN95 masks. Be aware of fake N95 and KN95 masks. This is particularly true if you're ordering from big websites like Amazon. Go to websites you know, that you, know, you can trust, um, things like you know, an, uh, um, a known and established uh, retailer. Those are your preferred sites. Make sure you cover both your nose and your mouth, um, such as like this. Um, covering just your mouth and not your nose or wearing it in different ways, this doesn't help um, in terms of transmission. And then if your glasses fog, which certainly happens to me as well as other people, there are special adhesive nose strips that can be used, or there are anti-fog, um, like the swim goggle anti-fog strategies. Those can be actually really helpful for trying to decrease the amount of fogging that occurs. There are a couple of key resources. Um, 
which I'm not going to go through, but the CDC in the United States has provided a series of really nice websites, basically a, a, just a, updating everybody about COVID-19 and how to care for somebody if that person has COVID-19, as well as how do you care for somebody if you have COVID-19 or a parent has COVID-19 and needs to take care of somebody. So um, there's also uh, information about the, the registry, the, the, the COVID study. Um, and so this one, um, this is our publication. And then the International Clinical Council on FOP guidelines are also here. So I encourage you to check those out. And with that, I will stop uh, and thank everybody. Thank you, Dr. Xiao, for that important update and for taking the time to join us today. Unfortunately, Dr. Xiao will not be able to stay for the Q&A portion of our discussion as he has a busy day ahead of him at the hospital. So he is sort of the exception to the rule that I stated at the beginning. We are going to be asking him two quick follow-up questions before he has to leave. So first, um, Dr. Xiao, that someone had posed a question about how FOP affects the lung and the heart. And I know that's a really big and broad question, but could you give a quick update on that? Absolutely. That's a very important and very good question. So there are a couple of things. Um, let's start with the heart. Uh, we know that FOP patients actually have an increased um, incidence of what we call asymptomatic con conduction abnormalities. These are small changes in how the heart sends electrical signals to actually cause the beating to occur. As far as we can tell, these are not associated with major problems in terms of you know, patients uh, and patient care. So we don't want people to panic or to be really worried about it. But it is something that you should be aware of is that if you go to the hospital and someone does an ECG and it looks a little bit funny, um, that that can be part of um, uh, FOP. And what we do encourage is that in those situations, you discuss with your doctor whether additional evaluation is necessary. Um, and again, just to, just to emphasize, these conduction abnormalities do not appear to be a major um, problem in patients with FOP. They're just, uh, just a little bit of a change that we can detect clinically, but again, doesn't really seem to cause major symptoms. The other question is related to lung health. So the two aspects that are most important are in patients with FOP that have um, heterotopic ossification around their chest wall, their lung expansion is not particularly good. And so what this ends up causing is that there's decreased lung capacity. So you can't take breaths as deep as um, somebody who doesn't have FOP. Um, but it also means that you can't cough as fast. And so um, if somebody with FOP and has uh, lung problems um, gets a upper respiratory infection, like either a viral infection or something like a pneumonia, what can happen is that it can be very difficult for them to cough and clear the secretions and clear the mucus, and it can either prolong the disease or actually make it very difficult for them to breathe. This is why we feel that things like respiratory exercises are absolutely critical um, because that tries to maintain as many of the muscles and the movement, you know, trying to maintain that for as long as possible. Um, and also helps that in the event that you do get an upper respiratory infection, you can clear the cough, you know, you can clear the secretions and you can cough as effectively as possible. So I had one follow-up question actually related to that lung health and some of the exercises that you suggested. Someone was asking if there's a specific number of times a day that you should use a spirometer. And also if you've talked with FOP patients that have used a spirometer, have they noticed a difference? So yes and yes. So what we do recommend is that you use a spirometer about um, three to five times a day. So for 10 really deep breaths, that's really to keep your lung capacity um, open. Now, if you're not able to do a spirometer or you don't like to do the spirometer, there are alternative activities. So we encourage things like 15 to 30 minutes of really active vocalizations. So if you're somebody who loves to sing and you can either sit in the car or sit in the shower, you can sing away for as loud as you can for about 15 to 20 minutes a day. That's really helpful. Same thing with like, you know, for a child, if you have like a cup of water and you can just blow bubbles, you know, that can be a fun game, at least for the younger children. And so you can definitely do that for about 15 to 20 minutes at a time. Um, so we definitely encourage that, that type of thing. And in terms of, um, you know, do patients feel that this, this makes a difference? 
it's a little difficult to tell in terms of the, the, the long run because, you know, we can't take um, a patient, clone them, and have one patient do this incentive spironator and other patient not. But what we do know from clinical data in other situations similar to FOP, um, things like asthma and um, COPD, or even post-surgical patients you know, without FOP but have had surgery, the incentive spirometer makes a huge difference in terms of recovery and making sure that their respiratory health is good. And so we believe that that is absolutely critical for maintaining the respiratory health of patients with FOP. Wonderful. Thank you, Dr. Xiao. Um, we will send you on your way now, and we're going to introduce the next speaker, who is Dr. Patricia Delay. She is a dermatologist at Hospital Israeliti Albert Einstein, and Dr. Delay is the founder of the Brazilian FOP Association, which was started in 2005 and now serves as a home for around 100 Brazilian FOP families. So thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Delay. I'll turn it over to you now. Thank you, Hope. Thanks everyone for being here today. Hello. We are going to talk about skin and drugs and the impact of drugs on the skin health and why this is so important to know for the FOP community. Next one, please. So the objectives of this presentation is first of all, not scare anyone. I realize that dermatology is a very, very scary um, speciality, especially when you show pictures. So that's why we are going to have our cute animals helping us through the presentation. Inform you all and alert so you all will be able to recognize the skin reactions that may be due to drugs. Next one. So uh, the adverse drug reactions may show a lot of symptoms or just a few may be light or even severe and cause hospitalization and death, may affect only skin or also organs and systems. For you to have an idea, 3% of all hospital admissions are because of drug reactions. FOP, the FOP community takes a lot of drugs for pain, anti-inflammatory anti drugs, so they can all lead to adverse events, and that's what we are going to discuss today. Next one, please. What is a drug reaction? Drug rashes, drug eruptions are reactions on your skin that may develop in response to certain drugs. While any drug can cause a reaction, certain drugs are more notorious for causing reactions. And then this comes to the antibiotics, to the non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and anti-seizure drugs. Steroids, hormone topical, can also ca cause drug reactions. And I'm going to show you uh, at the end of this presentation. Next one. Why drug reactions happen when drugs were supposed to help us instead of creating problems? A drug ra uh, rash or other reaction can occur as an allergic reaction, what means that this is very personal, a buildup of the drug that causes toxicity to the skin, a drug that makes the skin more sensitive to sunlight, interaction of two or more drugs, and sometimes it helps for no reason that you can tell. So uh, sometimes you look for an explanation and you don't find. Next one. So here are our, our cute friends helping us to, to recognize the syndromes that are related to drugs. Next one. First one we are going to talk about. So there are a lot of reactions to drugs, but I will show you some so you can recognize when you see it. The first one is the fixed erythema. It's usually localized, but it can be also, it can be uh, generalized. Uh, take the, mu the mucosal area, and it is a spot, usually a, a single one, uh, brownish, some kind, sometimes a little bit violet, and it goes away. When, once you stop the drug, it simply goes away. If you are re-exposed to the drug, it lights up like if it was, hey, I'm here. So it's very easy to recognize this kind of drug reaction. It lights up when you are re-exposed. And 
This eruption may develop after weeks or years of the regular ingestion of a drug. So this is important because sometimes we say, I always took this medicine. It's not going to happen now, but it may happen at any time of your life. And it also may show a little bit, a little bubble in the middle of the, of the, the, the spot. Next one, please. The drugs that cause it more are the antimicrobials, the analgesics and anti-inflammatories, sedatives and, and anti-convulsivants, antihypertensives, and other drugs. It can also be caused by um, food. Next one. So, shall I get scared? No, of course, we have ways out to treat it. Next one, please. The second one is the morbidiform reaction, drug reaction. Is that one that looks like missiles? You have seen that before. And sometimes I see people on the registry saying, oh, I have a rash. So now you see that a rash is not always because of a drug. It's not always the same thing. Some things uh, refer as a rash to an, a hives or something like this. So let's learn a little bit. This one is the most common form of drug eruption. Again, the antibiotics and anti-inflammatory drugs and bait killers are the most dangerous one. It may resemble the ones caused by virus and bacteria infections. It's mandatory that you exclude an, uh, an infection, a viral one or a bacterial one. And it has another name that doesn't matter right now. Next one. So it usually, on the first time, it appears one to two weeks after starting the drug, but it may occur up to one week after stopping it. On the re-exposure to the drug, skin lesions appear in one to three days. So you see that the more you expose yourself to the drug, it comes faster. It's not all that time to appear. It usually appears on the trunk and spreads to the limbs and neck. It's usually bilateral and symmetrical, and it has different formats. And the lesions that may be discrete, they may merge together to form large red plaques. Usually spares mucous membranes, but it can also be there. And it may be associated with mild fever and itch. As it improves, the redness goes away and the surface of skin peels off. Next one. So here it is. I think you have all seen this before. You go, you wake up scared and you go to see your doctor. Next one. When you see those spots. Next one. And no, it's not time to be scared yet. We can deal with it very well. Next one. Third one is the erythema multiform. It's an immune mediated typically self-limiting mucocutaneous condition and is characterized by target lesions, may involve the mucosal uh, environment. The episodes can be isolated, recurrent or persistent and the lesions are classic, are the target lesions that I will show you. Causes, antibiotics, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs and even vaccines as Ed was talking. It can also be caused by infections. Next one. So here it is. You see some uh, blisters. It can affect the hands. And you see it's really, really a target one. Next one. You see here on the, on the, uh, on the tongue and the, the really target lesion that you see up. Next one. And no, it's not time to be scared yet. We can easily deal with those lesions with steroids. So uh, as I was telling you, the drug reactions can be very scary, but uh, they are more scary than they really are. And there are some drug reactions that may be really, really scary that you're going to see at the end, but not this ones. Next one, please. Erythema nodosum. This is a very interesting one. It presents as tender red 
nodules on the legs and ankles. And it's very, very painful. Sometimes people say that they cannot walk and it affects the subcutaneous fat. The drugs that cause it are the antibiotics, non-steroidal non anti-inflammatory drugs, contraceptives, among others. Next one. So this is it. It's, it's usually very painful and it must, it, since it can also be caused by infections, it's when you go to your doctor, he will ask you some tests so he can exclude other causes. Next one. And no, it's not a reason to be scared. We can treat it and it's going to be okay. Next one. Hives, the urticaria, is characterized by very itchy hives with or without surrounding red flares. It's superficial and you see like, it looks like an insect bite that lasts for a few minutes or even 24 hours and moves to another place. And what we get scared when you have the urticaria is that it can block your breathing. So you need, to, yes, this one, will make you go to the hospital if it's really serious. Next one. So the causes include infections, bacteria and viral, food, as you all know, and drugs again, aspirin, antibiotic, non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, opiates, and radio contrast media, and sometimes vaccination, and insect bites. Next one. So here you are, next one. You see, I think everyone has seen this kind of lesion before. Next one. And this is very, very typical. And uh, the, the fun thing, uh, not fun, but the, what's interesting about the urticaria and it doesn't last much. It goes to one place to the other one. Next one. Okay. It's not a reason not to take a drug again. Wait, we can all deal with it. Next one. The purpura. The purpura is the sixth one that we are going to talk. It characterizes by those little small spots that are violet that may be isolated or go together. Next one. And here you are, usually on the limbs, and it can be very mild or very severe, as you see here. Next one. And yes, it's horrible, but also has a way out. Next one. Then we come to Stephen Johnson syndrome. This is the real serious one. And this is the one that you have to go to the hospital. No way out. It's rare, thanks God, acute, serious, and can be fa fatal. And it's a skin reaction where you lose all your skin like uh, a flake. It's nearly always caused by medications, antibiotic and 40%, antifungal, anticonvulsivants, and non-steroidal non, uh, anti-inflammatory drugs. Next one. Usually the patient has uh, symptoms, fever, more than 39 Celsius, sore throat, difficulty in swelling, runny nose and cough, sore red eyes, conjunctivitis, general aches and pains. So uh, this is something that may uh, have, for most drugs, the onset is in a few days, but can appear up to a month after you're taking the drug. Next one. So that's it. It's really bad. Next one. And yes, I am serious. This will take you to the hospital. Next one. So now the main, you, you, I think you understood that the main causes of drug reactions are painkillers and non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs. But then what about steroids? Next one. Steroids can also cause allergy. Everything. It's important that you all understand. Everything can cause allergy. So what we are talking now, it's just for you to recognize. It's not, uh, it's not uh, frequent, but it's important that we have in mind. 
The topic of steroids, for instance, if you use it for a long period of time, or if you use the ones that are that we say that have fluor inside, and uh, it has a vehicle that you are allergic to, you can have problems. They can cause atrophy of the skin, estriae, rosacea, perioral dermatitis, acne, and purpura. Can increase the hair on the site of application, pigment alterations, delay the wound healing, and exacerbation of skin infections that can also happen. Next one. The systemic, systemic steroids can also cause problems. You can have bacterial infections when you're taking it because your immunity goes down, fungal infections, viral infections, the skin can become, can become 